I know a lot of you guys, I'm glad to see a lot of familiar faces. It always makes the presentation a little bit easier. But um, in case you have not met me, my name is Paula Ripple. I'm an owner of Organize Well. I started my own organizing business about nine years ago. And I like to say that I've been an organizer all my life. I organize for friends and family for free many, many years, many, many times, whether they wanted me to or not. And um, I love what I do. I specialize in residential organizing and downsizing and moves and relocations. And what I'm gonna talk to everyone about today is solutions that we can put in place to have a more productive home. Um, many of us work from home and I'm sure we never imagined that 2020 would turn out the way that it did where we would be truly working from home and schooling from home and doing everything from home. So um, a big part of what I do is helping clients find balance between their stuff and their space and the storage that they have. So um, finding that balance in our own home environment is going to help us feel better overall. And there's some kind of basic rules of organizing, and I'm gonna talk about some specific cases and specific spaces, but and you're gonna see how these rules kind of flow overall, but I just wanna cover them before we start. And the very first place that we start when we're organizing is never going out and buy product. I know even when I started my own business, I went out and I bought so much inventory and I would come up to clients' houses like a rolling mobile container store. And within six months, I understood that I show up with my work bag, with my tools, garbage bags and moving boxes because the first place that we start is with an assessment, with understanding your why. Why do you want to be organized? understanding what's not working, understanding what you need to work better in your home, um, what your frustration or your pain points are, and understanding what does work, uh, making sure that we recreate the success of systems that you already have in place and what you hope to gain. Because when we understand our why, that gives us motivation to get us through all the next steps. So the second step is to sort what we have in a space and group by category. Again, not trying to organize, not trying to find homes for things, not making decisions about whether things need to stay or go or be donated or um, possibly consigned or do we need to have an estate sale. We don't wanna get bogged down with decisions. We wanna understand exactly what we have by category because it's a lot easier to make decisions about a category of things than it is a whole bunch of individual decisions throughout the day. Um, and then finally, once we have things sorted, we're gonna edit every category and, um, and make those decisions at that point. And finally, now that we have, you know, we have our plan, we have our guidelines, we've sorted, we've grouped, we've edited, now it's time to find a place for everything and put things in their place and to use containers to help them stay in their place. Because the last step is also the most important, which is creating a system that we can maintain and that's easy to reset even when times are, are challenging or we're very busy. Um, I can, you know, any organizer can come in and create an amazing space. In fact, sometimes people even do this themselves. They organize, they go all in, they work all day, and two weeks later it looks like it did before. So my biggest payback to my job, I mean, the thing I love is when I work with clients and maybe I helped a client do a kitchen two years ago and they asked me to come back and help with a basement or a garage and I come back and I see that that kitchen is still functioning and it's still easy to maintain, it's still working for them. That's my biggest goal is to leave people with not just organized, but able be able to stay organized. So why organize? Again, coming back to that plan, like what's your motivation? Well, the number one reason is that it saves time and time is precious. Um, research shows that we will spend a total of 153 days of our lives searching for misplaced items. And that we also on average tend to lose about nine things a day or spend time searching for about nine things a day with our phones and our keys and sunglasses and misplaced papers topping that list. So organization saves time. And I'm gonna talk about specific spaces as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about kitchens, offices, kid spaces, our digital spaces, 
which have become very complex. And then um, a Q&A at the end that, that Molly, and again, if somebody wants to put like a, open a question, you and Molly can help me monitor that. So, all right, so let's get started with kitchens. And I'm starting with kitchens because a lot of times it's the center of the home, but it's also become a space that has taken on um, unusual prominence this year. As many of us are cooking more from home, true confession, I, my favorite thing for dinner is takeout and um, or going out to eat. And, you know, I probably have not cooked as much in my own home. Um, you know, I've, I've probably done three years worth of cooking in the last month. So when I'm working with a client on a kitchen, kitchens are workspaces. They're a space where we do a lot of the work, and sometimes even the bulk of the work at home depending on the client. So I want to be sure that I understand exactly how that client uses their space. And, um, you know, for example, a mom that may be a stay-at-home mom or work-at-home mom with preschoolers is going to use their kitchen very differently than maybe an empty nest or couple. So I want to be sure that I organize that workspace to represent the work that's actually being done there. And, you know, we've talked about the kitchen triangle. So like if you're in a kitchen, if you draw a line from your stove to your sink, to your refrigerator, back to your stove, in most kitchens, it makes a triangle. That's the valuable real estate because that's where you spend the bulk of your time. So everything in that zone should definitely support the work that you do. Um, and, you know, understanding how you, how like I have clients that are bakers. So they spend a lot of their time um, baking and we make sure that we have baking um, things in that zone. Maybe um, we also create secondary zones. Like in this kitchen, you can see we have like a beverage area and a snack area. So if you're a busy family, sometimes having that thing. and finally um, knowing that if your prime real estate is in your work or your food prep zone there are things that don't belong there so like your seasonal appliances um, or rarely used appliances back stock which is just a fancy word for all the extra paper towels and cans of soup that we own right now finding maybe a secondary location in the home um, a set of metro shelves in the basement or a cabinet in um, in you know another location so that we can kind of create a seasonal pantry is super helpful for creating space and sometimes you know i always kind of think of organizing solutions or sometimes like um it's almost like when you use such a have to take the standardized test and you can eliminate the least likely answers but then you're left with a bunch of answers that kind of an answer the question and you have to pick the best answer organizing solutions can be that way too so there's two pictures of the same drawer and um, there's an organizing solution in the first case scenario, and it, but it's just not working well in this drawer. This is the drawer that's right next to the sink, so it's prime real estate for the person who uses this kitchen. So we went through, we sorted what is in the drawer, we edited, so there, an example, there's a candy thermometer that's rarely used, but it's thrown in here. So we move that to a less valuable part of the kitchen so that it's kind of with the other seasonal baking things. And we put organizing solutions in place that actually work in the store. Um, we put an indoor knife block. So not only are the knives kept nicely, but it's you know a safety issue for the client. You know, you're not opening the drawer and risking cutting your hand. And we also used a shelf liner that I love. It's kind of, it has a grippy surface. So when you lay things out, they stay just in that position, no matter how hard you slam your drawers. And um, it's a great and it's a maintainable system. Everything is easy to see, everything is easy to use, and everything is easy to put back in place. So this is an example of kind of picking the best answer for a solution. And in kitchens, um, some of my favorite solutions are um, containers that kind of pull the small things together so that in our pantries, um, we can keep like with like. I mentioned the shelf liner. So that's great for keeping things in place in drawers and cutting like the, the loud clatter down in our drawers and cabinets. There's also a wonderful shelf liner. If you have like the wire shelves in your pantry, it's a thicker, clear plastic um, that you can lay down on your wire shelves and it makes it easier to store smaller things on those wire shelves so they don't always kind of sit wonky or want to tilt and makes them super easy to clean. And um, use your vertical space. 
So if you use your upper cabinets as pantries, like for storage for canned goods or spices, using your, your stackers are great solutions. And then using your vertical um, shelf spaces. So the more that you can, can fit, it's, it's way easier to use a stacker or additional shelves than it is to pile things. And you, you don't want to have that stack of 12 bowls. And, um, and the last are drawer, like pull out organizers. Um, drawers in base cabinets store 70% more than just that standard base cabinet with that weird little half shelf that they stick in the back. So having drawer, like pull out drawers, um, substantially increases your storage space and the usability because you're not bent over searching way in the back or losing things in the back. Um, I see this a lot of times with clients. We ended up with a lot of expired things because they go to the back of cabinets um, and get lost there forever. And then, you know, it wouldn't, you know, a lot of times the biggest problem with our kitchens is not the kitchen stuff, but it's the stuff that doesn't even belong into our kitchens, but it just migrates there. And certain parts of our countertops and our islands almost function like a clutter magnet. And it's the weird things like our keys and our sunglasses, all those things that we're looking for tend to land here, along with our kids, you know, the broken toys that need to be fixed, random tools, charging cords, electronics, the remote to the TV, the library books that need to be returned, they all end up migrating into this space. And so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is how to keep the non-kitchen things um, out of your kitchen. I'm gonna talk about having landing zones. And every home has a landing zone, you just may not like the landing zone that you have. And, um, and this kind of leads to my next statistic and actually it's an amazing study that UCLA did and they confirmed that there's a direct correlation between women's stress and the levels and the density of household objects that they could actually measure increased cortisol in women when they were home at the end of the workday and they were dealing with the family belongings. So when you are coming home, you know, or coming around the corner and looking at that cluttered counter and you feel stressed, you actually are stressed. Your body is being flooded with stress hormones. So there's our number two reason why we want to organize. It's we're saving time, but we're also reducing our stress and everybody wants that. And speaking of stress, this is a client who hired me a couple of years ago. And this is her, her breakfast room table. This is the table that her family eats on and does their homework on. And we talk about how everybody has a landing zone. It just may not be the landing zone that they want. This is exactly that situation. So a lot of circumstances lead up to how a table ends up looking like this. And for this particular family, it was a professional couple. They had kids at that really busy age, you know, upper elementary, middle school, where they're involved in a lot of activities, where there's a lot of homework, there's a lot of things going on but the kids are old enough to drive, so the parents turn the car every evening. And this home, the way it was set up, is you kind of walked in the back door directly into the kitchen. So there wasn't really a place to go. Also, they had not put organizing solutions in place because they were hoping to move into their forever home. And I have total sympathy with this because I'm living this scenario right now. They had started a remodel on a home in their neighborhood. They wanted to stay in their neighborhood um, on the North Shore and you know, a six month remodel had turned into a two, re two year remodel while they had run into like a lot of issues with the home and permitting and things like that. So this mom hired me to basically make sure that this was not replicated in the new house. So we worked to create um, a landing zone in the new house. I'm gonna double check my questions. Okay, I'm gonna read through here. Okay. <laughs> this may or may not be what my dining room looks like right now. You know, and I think that's a good point, um, Molly, because at some times our dining room does look like this, but kind of having a home for everything means that it doesn't stay like this. Um, and this is also another client who called me very stressed out because her kitchen was always disorganized and she was so frustrated with the amount of stuff in her kitchen. The reason her kitchen was disorganized, again, came down to the fact that she had nowhere for the landing zone things to go. Um, this is her laundry room. And in a lot of houses in Chicago land, the door from the garage opens directly into like the hallway or the laundry room. 
and there's no closet. I don't know what architects think when they design house plans for this part of the world, but it is very common for me to work in homes that they have one tiny closet by the front door and there's no storage by the back door, which is where the family spends the bulk of their time. So um, what we did is we got into the space, you remember the steps, she hired me to organize her kitchen and her kitchen had wonderful storage, it was a beautiful space, all of her kitchen things were well stored. Her problem was this room because when this room got full, these things migrated into the kitchen, onto her table, onto her island. So we worked up a plan for this room. I came in and I sorted everything. So cleaning items were sorted together. Sometimes you don't even realize how many cleaning items or duplications and cleaning items that you have until you see it together. Um, we made storage. We used shelving on the walls and we broke down, you know, there was the storage on the top shelf and the things that were rarely used, like rarely used appliances, um, the things that you want to grab easily, like extra paper towels um, or a place for the mail to go could live on that bottom shelf. We opened up the countertop so that she had room to fold clothes versus letting them stack up. And we made sure that we got everything out of that room that didn't belong. We used backs of doors. We got hooks up on walls so coats had places to go. And, um, you know, fixing this one room solved all of her kitchen organizing problems. Again, this was, we talk about that balance. There's just too much stuff um, for the amount of storage that was in such a key area of the home. So just by providing the storage, we gave her balance. So when we're creating these, these zones, um, I have what I like to create in every home, what I call a find it zone. So having a place for paper and mail to come into and go out of. Um, knowing where, you know, having, I love using um, these art boxes you see on the top shelf because that's a great home for school paper and the art projects that come home and the photographs and things, the school pictures. So it has a holding space versus being stacked uh, on countertops. Having a place for the electronics and the cords to go where everybody in the house knows where to find an envelope and stamps. So kind of having that find its own so that you're not always looking for tape because someone else in your family can't find things. Label everything um, to make it even more apparent for all the people that you share a space with. And then having those drop zones so you can get in and get out the door faster. Um, I mentioned that a lot of homes don't have closets. Even if you are blessed with a closet, you may have a kind of family that just doesn't like opening closet doors and taking hangers out, hanging coats up. So um, it's a great idea to use all available wall space. I wish I had taken a better photo of this room because behind the access door, we put like two rows of hooks. So there's a hook for every possible coat, every one breaker, the scarves, the baseball hats, all have a place to go without counting on people finding the closet. Having, you know, baskets that are positioned in a place that you can hold on to hats. Um, we use the back of the hall door for a, um, one of the, like the shoe racks, you know, the, the ones that has the little pockets for shoes to go in. And in the wintertime, that's where hats and mittens live. And in the summertime, it's where sunglasses and sunscreen and bug spray live. So just even using the back of the door that usually stands open, that gave us a ton of storage. And it's the kind of stuff that usually tends to either get wadded back on a shelf um, or just left out onto the surfaces. So um, using backs and doors for storage is a great tip for these spaces because sometimes you don't need a lot of storage, but you do need that point of view storage. So um, let's talk about home offices now. I like to say that my favorite customers are the people who live and work under one roof. And I could have never imagined that we would be in a year where we were living and working, um, where we were working from home. For, for many of us, it has been um, quite the challenge. And I think when I talk about that balance of stuff to space, I think that you see this very clearly in home offices and work offices. So case number one is a client that hired me. Um, he's a um, physician that's in medical research, blessed with storage. There are, you're seeing three bookshelves here. I think there were seven total in this office. There were two desks. There were file cabinets. Um, there was every type of office storage that you would ever need. The problem is the stuff overwhelmed the storage. 
So I came in while he was at work and I sorted. So this is, you're looking at this after a sort. So one entire bookcase is taken up with office supplies. And his particular line, like many of us, most of his communication is done via DocuSign or emails because he has to have a um, electronic um, trail for all information and changes. So he's got an entire shelf of envelopes and mailers and things that he has no use for, but they're office supplies that he had from a long time and he's just moved them from location to location as they've grown. We have a huge amount of pens. We have a huge amount of binders. We have an entire banker box full of legal pads. And we also have on the second shelf, the one in the middle, you're seeing a lot of outdated technology. So you're seeing operating, you know, the guidelines for operating systems and computers that he doesn't even own anymore. You're seeing a lot of floppy drives and the two and a half inch drives from jobs and teaching positions that he's held in the past. He's not quite sure what's on them anymore. Um, we're also seeing in the foreground, you see storage solutions that aren't actually storing anything or not storing things effectively. And then on the third shelf, the one on the far right, what you're seeing is a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with work at all. There's um, a Christmas decoration that he promised his wife that he would fix. There's photos from his old office that he brought into the new office and doesn't really have anywhere to hang up. There's memorabilia. Um, there's stuff that belonged to his parents. So all these things in his office space that do nothing to support work. And that's the thing that we focused on when we worked in this person's office is finding a donation. You know, there's a lot of great resources and people that really need office supplies. So we were able to do that with the, with the older technology. There were a lot of things he was able to let go now that he could see how much space he actually had devoted to floppy drives and, and things like that. Um, we were kind of able to go through and, and do a very quick edit of those things. Um, it took him maybe, 20 minutes where we could get rid of things, but there were some things that, that he thought were important, but he wasn't sure. The kicker is, of course, he doesn't have a drive in his house that can read um, that technology anymore. So we brought, we brought things to a um, technology. Uh, so this photo is giving someone anxiety. It was giving him anxiety too. So that's why he hired me. Um, but we, we found a way to get the technology into a more modern format, the information that was on, on the outdated technology made better use of storage solutions, and we found a home for the things, um, the unfinished projects. And I always warn people, because a lot of times our home offices are also kind of dumping grounds, and there are places where we put our photos that need to be organized, or that lamp that needs to be rewired, um, or you know, household paper. Try, you know, if you are working from home, when you're in that workspace, you should not be seeing anything that doesn't directly support your work. Because when you lift your eyes up and you look at something, that unfinished project, you don't even realize it, but your mind starts processing. Your eyes see it and your mind's like, oh, I gotta do that. And for depending on our brains, it can take three to 10 minutes for us to be able to get fully engaged back into the task that we're working on. So just having those oddball projects in our office or those those to do's that have nothing to do with work. Um, every time we glance up and look at them, we could be losing 10 minutes a day. So second case was a client who hired me because she felt that her office was too cluttered. Again, we talk about that balance in her in her mind, it felt there were things on the floor, it felt too cluttered, she thought we were gonna have like a big editing. And in her case, it wasn't so much that she had too much clutter, it's that she had no storage space and no work, nothing that supported her work from a storage point of view as she worked. And she, it's actually, I, I, I never talk about who my clients are, but I talk about this particular client because she's actually posted this on her own Facebook and I've spoken at her store. It's Marianne Evans, your best friend's home, your best friend's closet. Phenomenal, phenomenal store. Um, if you've ever been in there, if you know her clients, they love her. She has a signature color um, of pink. And um, what we did is she had a budget and Ikea worked perfectly with that budget. So we went out and we picked up you know, this, this office unit for her, spent a night putting it together and had it in place. And um, it gave her beautiful display space. 
because when she looks at these things that her customers have gifted her that represent her store, they inspire her and they boost her motivation. And we also have hidden space. If you notice the drawers, sometimes, you know, not seeing, you know, last year's tax returns or your, you know, no, your last, you know, your office supplies, your extra legal pads. It's nice to have a place to put that. It's where it's not necessarily out and visible. And most important to her is that we had a space where she could sit down and actually have a conversation with some of, with her employee. So she had a space where she could just have that direct one-on-one -on -one interaction with employees that was very important to her and how she ran her business. Remember that that workspace should support you and how you work. And this is a good example. Well, both of these cases, one, there was just so much in that office that had nothing to do with how that person worked um, and it was just getting in his way. And in the second case, the office just did not support the work from the lack of, of storage and tools. And then I just, you can see from behind me, this is my office. And I know these things as an organizer, I know that our workspace directly impacts our productivity. So I'm gonna tell you my own story. Um, my husband changed jobs about a year ago and he's traveling more, but when he's home, he's working from home. So he took over my old office because it's quieter and he can have phone conversations without us hearing him all throughout the house. And I said, don't worry about it because most of my work I do, I do in clients' homes. And I'll just go take over the guest room, which I don't have a before picture because I would be too, too I, I didn't take a before picture because I couldn't stand it. The before was pretty bad. Um, I was working off a small desk. Things were just dumped on the floor and I was busy, busier than I've ever been last summer, last fall, all the way through the winter. And I knew in my head that my productivity was being impacted, but it really kind of came to a head when I lost a receipt. For the first time in nine years, I lost a customer's receipt that I bought material on and I still haven't found that receipt. It was absolutely mortifying for a professional organizer to admit that, but you know, that was my point. So in February, I made the decision that I, I just literally could not work this more any, anymore. So um, my budget was not very big, so made that Ikea run, and um, actually had Ikea deliver. And I'm gonna talk about the storage and why it works so well for an office, um, especially for the type of person who's very visual. Um, visual people tend to be pilers, and I am definitely the very definition of a piler. I hate filing papers that I'm working on because it feels like they are disappearing, and I'm afraid that I'm gonna lose them because I'm so visual. But I don't like seeing visible clutter. So I have hidden space here behind doors. So my extra printer paper, my office supplies, prior year tax returns, um, client projects that I've closed out, they have a home. But I also have um, these open bins that I can quickly grab things. I don't see the clutter, but they're very close at hand. They're, this is right behind my desk. Um, everything is labeled. And my paper, my working files are vertical. I always say the best piles are the ones that are vertical. And I'm actually gonna show one of these solutions. It's an open top file box. I don't know if you guys can see this. But they easily fit on a bookshelf. Sometimes we don't necessarily have file cabinets or file drawers. I've had clients that have had almars or buffets in their office and they needed to use that for paper. So having you know these open top file boxes with the hanging files makes um, gives us the ability. I had a client who had a desk but his desk drawers had broken a long time ago and we just went ahead and pulled the desk drawers out and then used these in the space where the desk drawer normally goes. Um, I have a client that bought a lovely file cabinet um, but it just wasn't set up to actually hold files in, in the right way. So we were able to use these and set these down inside her file cabinet. So when she was working on her kids' schoolwork or medical documentation, she could just pull these out and use these. And that's why I like them. So if I'm working on a project, I can pull this paper out and then I can just slide it back into place on my cabinets behind me. And one thing I always caution when I'm working on an office, I try to leave a little bit of open space. So you'll see one bin um, on the left side and a little bit of room on a shelf. And actually, if I go back, I did the same thing in Marianne's office. I always try to design a little extra space because we know new stuff is definitely coming into that space at some point. And we want to be able to make room or else it will just end up on the floor. 
So a uh, question from Lisa, where did you find the storage boxes in the open storage area, Ikea? Yes, the, the white ones with um, the little hole, like the thumb hole at the beginning. Yes, they are actually Ikea products. Um, every, actually everything you see in this, in this photo other than the open top file boxes. You can get the open top file boxes. They're manufactured by Iris. You can order them on Amazon, or you can, um, you can also get them through a container store. And, um, but yeah, I love these. They're, they're actually like a hard plastic, so you can, wipe, you can write on them with, um, with a dry erase marker and wipe them off, so it's a fast way to label things. And, okay. So that's her questions. Oops, let me flip forward. And then I'm gonna talk about kids' spaces. And kids' spaces are some of my favorite to organize, unless it's my own kids. Um, but I will say this as a mom, having kids' space organized makes everyone in the family happier. Because no child likes their mom, you know, in their room going, why does this look this way? And uh, no mom likes having to stand in the space and say those things. So, um, and I love the statistic, um, less stuff means more play. And it's amazing because it seems almost inverse of what um, we found is that research found, I have to move this to read it, research found that the average 10 year old owns 238 toys, but plays with just 12 daily. And what we see with kids using their space is that the less that kids have in their room, the kids are very sensitive to clutter, that they naturally gravitate towards schedules in organized spaces, and they do better in those spaces, that you know, they are sensitive to the stress that's caused by clutter as well. And that kids that are in an organized environment, a less cluttered environment, tend to play more effectively. They tend to be more creative, in their play and they tend to have deeper play. Sometimes when there's just so much stuff in the, in the in a space, you see kids who tend to, they look like they're just shuffling stuff or, or moving stuff around all day. And we want to avoid that. And you know, with kids, it's always a balancing act. You know, that stuff to storage definitely applies, but it applies on a much faster timetable with, with kids. Because I tell parents, you're gonna be, you know, in those spaces editing, um, and tweaking that storage system every six to nine months. And the reason why is because they're growing and they're completely changing. I mean, you have, you're dealing with almost a completely different person every nine to 18 months when you're raising children. They're, they will outgrow entire wardrobes, none of their shoes will fit. Um, if you've ever had, you know, that, that stage, especially when they're just growing so rapidly, they're outgrowing entire wardrobes every six months, four to six months. Um, if you've ever had a teenage son, you know, you put like their, their best dress pants on like in June and then you put them back in those pants in July and they look like capri pants. Um, so you really kind of need to stay on top of that. Their, their reading comprehension levels will completely change. Their curriculum at school completely changes. Their hobbies will change. Um, their interests in sports and extracurricular activities, you know, even their decorating style. And, you know, we had an organizer speak um, at our national level, and she specializes in organizing for children, and she talked about even learning modalities change. So, you know, the child that may be a visual learner at one age will literally go through a stage where they're, you know, more of an auditory or kinesthetic. It was, it was a very interesting presentation, but, you know, it just kind of brings home that reality is that you really have to constantly, it's almost like you're, instead of organizing for one child for 18 years, think of it as you're organizing for 18 different children um, over that same time frame. We talked about the amount of stuff that kids have. Um, anytime that we can take the content and divide it, it makes everyone's life easier. I mentioned that kids do better in uncluttered spaces and they usually are pretty good about if you can take the overall collection of things and divide it into half or thirds and do a toy rotation. It works really great for toddlers, preschoolers especially, because you just don't have the volume. You're not fighting the volume. And my biggest point is that empower your child to be part of the organizing process. When I'm organizing kids' spaces, I always recommend that I work with the child in the room. It's their space, it's their stuff. And just like I said at the beginning, it really helps me to understand the client. When I'm in their space, they are the client. So here's a before picture of a lovely young lady's room. She's a sixth grader, she's athletic. 
um, sweetheart of a girl. Mom is not happy with how the room looks. And we've done most of, of the house together and this is the room that we saved to last. And um, I always say to parents, when you're walking in and you see a lot of visible clutter, you don't start with the visible clutter. The reason why there's a lot of stuff out on the bed and on the floor is it's usually because um, our storage spaces are taken up with the things that they were using a year ago and the things that fit a year ago. So when we start in a space like this, we're gonna actually start in the closet. We're gonna start pulling things out from under the bed and in the corners of the rooms and out from behind the drawers because that is the stuff that's usually easier for us to make decisions about. In this case, her closet looked organized because her mom was an organized person, but she hated using it because it was hard to fit more stuff in it. And the reality is, is she's, she was a competitive swimmer. She just had a growth spurt. Almost nothing fit her in that closet. So once we went through the closet, we opened up a ton of space. And it wasn't a huge closet, so we made an agreement that we would transition things seasonally. So we, this was actually in the dead of winter when we were working on this room. So we pulled out all the summer stuff. We put it in space bags and vacuum packed it down and set it over um, up on a, on a high shelf. So she had more, even more hanging space than what she was used to. Um, talking to my, my sixth grade client, I learned that she loves to do her homework in bed. She also is very creative and she likes to write her own books and illustrate them. So she was artistic. So we created zones. The cabinet that is like closest to the door that you see right next to, to the chair would be on the left hand side of the chair. Um, we decided that this is our homework center our reference book center. So this is the place where all of your schoolwork and your school supplies go. And then the cabinet on the other side of the chair, we created as a place to hold all of her art supplies and her creative work. And I explained to her the benefit of having two different zones because paper looks a lot alike. And when you let paper mix together and the school bus is about to come in 10 minutes and you're going through all of your you know, stories that you've written looking for today's math homework, that can be very frustrating. So just zoning that paper and those, those two different activities was gonna make it a lot easier for her to manage her room. Total buy-in because it made sense to her. Double check my questions. The second thing, um, Oh, thanks, JJ. It, it is. It's, you know, basically where the outgrown, outgrown clothes go to die is in the storage facilities. Sixth grade is an unusual age. I mentioned this young lady was a sixth grader. And they're not exactly a little kid anymore, but they're not yet ready to be, you know, a teenager or whatever the term is these days. And there were a lot of toys in her room. And, you know, what I said to her, first of all, is, you know, and I would say this to any child and any client, we don't get rid of anything that you're not ready to get rid of. If you tell me and you're 100% certain this is something that you can let go, we will find home for it, but we are also gonna create a maybe pile. That felt very comfortable for her. So we went through all the toys and you know, even her mom was surprised by the amount of stuff that she was willing to get, to get rid of. So then we're left with the, may, the must keeps and the maybes. And we brokered an agreement that the must keep stay in the room in a home. So that's the bins that you see over under the window. And then to the side of the bins, you see her collection of stuffed animals. So these are her games. She likes to play with her friends when they come over. It's her robot. She's just getting into robots. It's her um, beloved plastic animal collection and some dolls. And these are the things that she just wasn't ready to let leave her room. There were toys that she wasn't ready to let go, but she was okay with them not being in her room. So we packed those up in a bin, we labeled them, we went down together to the basement, showed her where they are, and then we also came to an agreement that she and her mom would take a look at this bin, you know, six to nine months from now, and if she was ready to let go of those things, that maybe she could hand those down to her cousins. What you see left on the bed is stuff that we had actually set aside to go to a neighbor's kid who was a couple of years younger, so they were gonna hand down. So we did this in about two hours and 45 minutes. And uh, like I said, it's always fun working with kids. Yo, okay, so Molly had the question. I think it's way harder for my husband and I to get rid of kids' toys than it is for them. The memories are too strong. That is such an excellent point. 
such an excellent point because I've even done it to, to my own child when she was, you know, editing her possessions before she went to college and she was taking this big stuffed alligator to the donation pile. And I said, are you sure? Because I'm remembering the day that we got the big stuffed alligator and what was going on in her life. And I was overwhelmed by memories and I was, you know, a mom in the throes of, you know, their oldest going to college. So I was a little emotional. Yes, that happens to all parents. But I think in the long run, empowering them to make those decisions is huge. And I think that giving our kids organizing skills is like one of the best skills that we can teach them because it is going to serve them for them to have the ability to manage their schedules and their environments when they get into high school, when they go to college, when they're living on their own and sharing the space with another significant other. Those are definitely skills that are going to kind of reap a great reward. So, um, when you do run in those things where you're feeling a little bit emotional and they're okay with letting them go, um, if you have the space, sometimes just putting those together in a bin, labeling these, you know, label them something that makes sense. Emotional toys that mom's not ready to let go um, is perfectly fine to put in a label and put them somewhere until you, you guys are both ready. And I, I do, I, I really strongly discourage clients, you know, don't feel pressured to get, get rid of stuff. There's only a few cases in life where we absolutely have to make hard decisions really fast. And those are sometimes in moves or downsizes, you know, with some ways, you know, confronting something that's a bigger health challenge. Um, but most of the time, if we can manage these decisions better, we can, we can make sure people are a hundred percent comfortable before um, they let go of something. I'm going to scroll down. Uh, that's what we do. Thank God for a crawl space. So true. You just have to remember to check things in that crawl space. Um, uh, oh, hi, Ellen. We'll talk to you later. Okay. So again, this didn't take a long time. And, you know, sometimes with working with kids, they're a lot better. I mean, my own kids are this way. It's always the running joke that other people see your kids at their best. Moms don't. So sometimes having an organizer in the room, um, the kid will be much more engaged and, and, um, less, there's less eye rolling um, than you get from your own kids. And I say that as a mom, I get plenty of eye rolling. And then again, picking the right solution. You can have, you know, good storage. Um, in fact, the storage solution that you see on the left, if you Google um, storage for kids art supplies, this is probably going to come up in, you know, the Google shopping list. But it's never been my favorite storage. It's one of those, it's like a shelf, but it has dowels and the little bins are supposed to sit. Um, it was kind of developed for educational purposes. These bins require a lot of maintenance um, to, or else they sit kind of wonky or they're falling out all the time. And this particular mom, um, my first suggestion was that we just take everything, all the small storage units out and put shelves in the closet. This was her kid's playroom. And she said, it's not always gonna be their playroom. I'm not ready to put something permanent into the shelf. And she happened, actually happened to be a doctor. She says, what I want is something like a crash cart, something that I can roll out and they can do their art stuff, do their school stuff. And when I want everything picked up, it can go back into the crash cart and I can roll it back out of the way. Crash carts are very expensive, but container store is not necessarily so. So what we did is we used uh, the alpha standing drawers and we put them on the casters, the alpha casters. So they roll, roll in and roll out. And we broke the storage down. So that first unit that you see, everything is labeled. We have scissors and glue contained in the top drawer. We have the colored pencils, regular pencils, and pencil sharpeners in the second drawer. And you can just march on down. There's crayons, the markers, there's containers, you know, within the drawers that are keeping the fat markers away from the skinny markers. Um, and we basically created, you know, an art and school project center so that it easily rolls over to their work table. But when mom is ready for these things to be put away, it's very easy for kids to put these things away and then roll them back out where she can't see the clutter. The second unit is for the things like the projects and the model car systems and the things like that, that you don't necessarily want your kids working on when you're not kind of supervising, you wouldn't want those things out every day. So we kind of made that distinction um, or maybe the holiday decorating packages and things like that. So we made it a little easier um, or a little less easy for the kids to get to those things um, so that you don't end up with glitter on your house, around your house when you're, you know, coming in from a busy work day. So just to kind of sum up for kids and kids storage, having activity zones. Um, 
just like in your office, just like in your kitchen, having a zone for specific activities so the Legos can live together and the games can live together and the artwork lives together and that you have specific times where you, where you work into zones. One of the other things, especially in family spaces, shared spaces, if you can encourage your kids or enforce this rule is that we clean up one zone before we move to the next zone. So puzzles get put away before we start pulling down um, the arts and crafts. Kid-friendly containers. Kids are very good organizers. I always tell people, if you don't believe me, go to your kid's classroom, because I guarantee you that their coat is not on the teacher's desk and their chairs aren't like their, their, their chairs upright, there's not crayons all over the floor. Um, kids are actually surprisingly, even very young kids, um, understand organizing techniques because they learned them in school. So definitely implement those in the house. Um, keeping things off the floor is going to make everybody happier. And the floor kind of works. It's almost like it's magnetic because if a couple things up in the floor, next thing you know, you have 50 things on the floor. Cutting the toy collection down or, you know, reducing it by thirds and rotating that means that even on those days where they pull, on those rainy days when they're home all day and they pull everything out, it's still only a third of what you actually have to deal with versus they pulled every toy they own out. Um, limit access to the messy things and then edit every six to nine months. So the last topic that we're going to talk about is organizing digital space, deleting with intention versus having delete. So the first thing we're going to talk about photos and I'm going to date myself here a little bit because I'm 52. So when I was a teenager or young adult and you went on vacation, we actually went with cameras and rolls of film and you took photos until you ran out of film and then you came home and if you're feeling really extravagant you might get your film developed into double so you could share it with your friends. Smartphones changed everything. Digital cameras, in fact I think 85% of all photos taken now are taken on smartphones. People have thousands and thousands and thousands of photos and they don't even know where to start. Well you start with that plan. So before you start trying to edit photos start considering how do you want to use and enjoy your photos? Um, 10 years ago, I had an intention of scrapbooking all of my photos. I've kind of let that go because I see that my kids don't, they're not, they're never going to be, they're the Instagram generation. They would rather have a digital album and, you know, have things organized in a way that we can share across, you know, our family, multiple generations and multiple geographic locations. Um, which comes to my second point, how do you want to share and hand down those photos, how do you want to preserve them? So understanding what your plan is for your photos and making sure that they're appropriately backed up or where we start. Um, and just as a side note, um, in the organizing world, we have organizers that all they do is photo organizing. So when I have a client that has a really big photo organizing job, I tend to bring in a photo organizer um, just because their skill set is, so, um, is so robust for this. But you know, these are, are kind of my roles is really kind of start with your plan. What do you what do you hope to do? The the worst case, you know, scenario is when you lose a relative and you have their photos and it's just such a massive collection, but you don't have any of the stories or explanations behind those photos. So um, it's so important that we um, we organize these things. So as I said, many of us have taken it, we have years of digital photos at this point, years and years. And it just seems so massive. So sometimes we start by creating rules to make it easier to delete. And um, I do this sometimes when people are very overwhelmed about um, a downsizing. I said, we're not gonna go in and downsize perfectly. We're gonna go edit in layers. And maybe that first layer is that you can go through your collection, and delete all the blurry photos. I'm a horrible photographer, so that would probably eliminate like 40% of my collection right off the bat. But deleting, the blurry ones where you accidentally cut somebody's head off, you know, in the photo, um, or even kind of thinking about how, um, how information has changed. A hundred years ago, if somebody went to Paris, they took a picture of the Eiffel Tower, of course, because it's not like you could find it unless you found it in a book or something like that. Now, if somebody wants to see what the Eiffel Tower looks like, um, they can Google it and see what the Eiffel Tower looks like. 
if you've ever gone to Paris, I guarantee you, you've taken, you know, a ton of photos of the Eiffel Tower. But the ones that may be most meaningful to you 50 years from now is the photo of you and your husband in front of the Eiffel Tower or your kids in front of the Eiffel Tower. And maybe that's the rule is that you keep landscape photos that have someone um, in the photo that has great meaning to you. So sometimes developing these rules ahead of time, uh, it gives us um, that disability or that sense of purpose. And when we go through and we start trying to edit in layers, it makes it a lot easier. And then schedule time. We take a lot of photos. I mean, even I, I have clients, I do it myself. I take photos of things in the pantry to remind me to buy things. So having a time weekly or monthly where you go back through your camera roll and you delete, you know, those photos that you, the, the ones that you took just to remind you of this, remind you of that. So making sure that you're seen on top of that collection is hugely important. Okay. Let's see. And I just pulled the statistic out. It just kind of blew my mind. 50% um, of people judge others with a cluttered inbox. So I guess there is such a thing as digital shaming. So if your inbox is a problem for you, um, just here are my rules for kind of keeping control of your inbox. First of all, your inbox is not a file box. So don't keep emails in there for reference or information to look up because it's so difficult to scroll and find those emails. Um, if you ever are in a situation where you need to do like a major edit, so those of us who've been on a trip or you've been super busy at work or a lot's going on in your life, you may find that your inbox builds. Um, one of the easiest way to do um, a quick um, delete is use your search, search function. So maybe you belong to professional organizations, you can search by those organizations and you can just go back and clean up that group. One of my favorite tricks, um, especially if I've been super busy and I'm in my family inbox is I will search, I will put in the search bar, the word unsubscribe and it will pull up all those emails from vendors that I have relationships with or my newsletters and things like that. So it's just very easy to delete a lot of stuff that is probably not actionable emails or things that I really need to pay attention to. So if I fall behind, I just do an unsubscribe search and then delete. Um, use folders. Again, we talked about organizing principles, putting like with like. So when you do have those emails in there that you need to reference, like maybe this has for example, emails that have a tax implication, create a folder called financial, and then move those things in there so that they come out of your inbox and into a folder. And you can even create rules. I use Microsoft Outlook. So I have a rule that if I receive an email that has the word receipt, um, and then a couple other rules, um, or comes from certain, certain people, then it just automatically, it never goes into my inbox. It goes straight into the folder. So it's one less thing that I have to do. And um, finally, when you have emails that are about an event, take all of that information and put it in your calendar and delete the event, which is my, my next topic, calendars. Calendars, especially digital cameras, are so robust and there's a ton of fields, everything from location to notes to tagging people. So just go ahead and put all that information on the event in your calendar, delete the email, the morning of the event, when you're trying to remember where to park and which door to walk through at the next conference um, or exactly where the Zoom link is, it's right there on your calendar. So you're not scrolling through emails trying to find that information. It's a huge time saver. Um, put um, not only the deadlines, but consider other Dubai dates on your calendar. For example, you may be um, on a Zoom call and somebody mentions they have this networking event coming up and you would love to participate, but you're not sure if you're going to be available yet. So maybe go ahead and put that networking event on your calendar, but also put your decision date, a reminder to make that decision, you know, at some point between now and then, so that when you do have more information or maybe you have deliverables that are due before that next meeting. So put the deliverable date on your calendar as an event. Colors or tags, especially if you have a shared family calendar, um, it's just an easy way, especially if you're visual, to kind of see at a glance what's going on in your day. And always remember to review, review tomorrow's schedule today. Um, the biggest advantage of digital information is that we can get stuff out of our heads and somewhere else so that we don't have to keep up with the details. But we do have to remember to kind of check in on, on these things. So talking for about an hour. Um, I'm going to open up questions next, but I do want to say like my big thing is that every 10 minutes that you spend organizing will save you an hour. And, um, and I truly 
believe that with all my heart. Um, I use the example, it takes the same amount of time. It may take you 10 minutes to hang a key hook out by the back door. It's gonna take the same amount of time to hang your keys up as it does to just toss them down on top of a table or on top of a pile of stuff. The real question is how much time do you wanna to spend tomorrow looking for your keys? So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see everyone's faces. And um, does anybody have any questions? I have a question, Paula. Yes. Okay, so I have a, um, a catch-all spot near our back door and there's the organized part with the keys and the things like that. And then I have a tray that is kind of the everything else, the things I don't have a space to you know, put it in yet and everything. Mm -hmm. Is that a plus or do, would you say don't, don't have that catch all do you, you should we put it away right away or is it okay to have that i think that is a good solution because there's the reality of life in raising kids and working um you don't have necessarily time to put everything away perfectly and sometimes things are transitional like you're coming in your home you need to get your husband to sign it or whatever and then it's going back out the door or something that you We'll only have to hold on to until this weekend and then it becomes relevant, you know, or what have you. So sometimes just having that tray where those oddball things can live until you have a chance to address them, you know, you may just be swamped. Like I know when I'm working during the week, for whatever reason, I hate doing the mail, but I have a basket where all the mail goes into for the week. And then I have like a little ritual where I watch Law and Order and catch up on my mail. And, um, you know, that's my, that's, my thing. So just having a place where those things can live until you have a second to get to them. I think the biggest, the, or really the only disadvantage is when we don't schedule the time to go through that tray or through that basket and it just builds and builds and builds and newer stuff falls on top of it and something important got lost in the bottom. That's the biggest danger or you're left with this giant overflowing basket and then somebody comes to visit. So people take that basket and they go hide it somewhere and then we never remember where those things are so it's as long as you're scheduling maintenance to get to it that's really a good system like i'm busy in the moment but i will get to this within the week sure that makes sense it absolutely does and and so full disclosure i, <laughs> I am extremely sentimental so sometimes it's the rock that my kids gave me goes in there and you know or or the shoestring that you're like, okay, I need to have another one or, you know, and so it's exactly. like this mix of just random things. And, um, and I do, I find myself not going through it often enough, but it's, it's interesting. So I have little junk drawers in my mind of like, that's, that's the acceptable place to put the horrible things. And then, you know, everything else is organized. So I, I do have that. And I think having those little pockets of flexible space, the only, the only problem is you don't, you just don't let them grow out of their pockets <laughs> and, and getting, getting in there and kind of just reviewing and making sure and having that spot for memorabilia. Cause you do like, you know, maybe in that moment, the rock is special, but maybe there's something so special about that rock that 10 years from now, it's still special. So kind of having a place right. for the super special things to go. Yeah. And look. Right. Thank you. Anybody else? Do. Uh, Paula, I have these um, very random L-shaped cabinets um, mm -hmm. in my kitchen uh, where the longer part of the L I cannot even reach. So it becomes this bottomless pit uh -huh. of, you know, little kitchen appliances that we bought once that we forgot that we have because mm -hmm. they, the, the breakfast sandwich maker gets thrown back there and then stuff just gets put in front of it. Is there a good way to organize something like that? There are good ways to organize it. It kind of depends on, you know, your price point. Can, is it like in the corner of, is the backside of the L, like, is it like a kitchen island or peninsula where you can access the backside or is it in a corner of the room? No, it's in a corner of the room where they almost just put another cabinet going the other direction. Okay. Um, so you open up the, the cabinet and you can see, you know, the short part of the L and then it turns and it's just sort of goes off into the abyss. Okay. So Shelf Genie and a couple of other manufacturers will retrofit those cabinets with this amazing little rack that it pulls out and then 
what's in the L comes forward. It's hard to describe, but okay. basically it will kind of all kind of come out. So Shelf Genie um, actually is affiliated with NAPO. So just by way of interest, but they'll come out and do an estimate and things like that. So I always tell people it's expensive. Um, well, not expensive. There's a cost and a return. So I had a client that had really high quality base cabinets and it was going to be her forever home. She had bought it. She loved it. She was, you know, she was retired and widowed. And this was the home that she was going to live the rest of her life in. It didn't make sense to tear out these cabinets that were such high quality, but the base cabinet storage was just horrible. It was your typical, your L's and your hidden corners and things like that. So it made sense to bring a company in like Shelf Genie and they retrofitted her base cabinets. We probably increased her storage by 70%. And then as I mentioned, she was retired. So it made her kitchen a lot more functional, not only for the health that she has today, but the, for the health that she may have 10 years from now. So that's an option. A lot of online companies also make those type of, of um, cabinets. And you know, if you're, if you're doing it yourself, you can definitely install them. I've done it myself. As a short-term solution, sometimes taking a bin and for example, you know, it's summertime. So like maybe your holiday baking, like if you have like your Christmas cookie press and cookie cutters and other Christmas tableware can get put together in a nice, you know, lidded bin and you slide that into the L, it's easy to slide back out. Like you, that can be part of your seasonal transition. So like come November, your grilling tools can go into that L or your summer, like your July 4th decorating platters and things like that can go into the L. So sometimes just using it for transitional space. So if you're planning on moving and you don't want to retrofit these cabinets or spend a lot of money. So, so those are my, my two, two best options is, is, you know, the, also the bins keep things from going into the L that you, um, that you, and then getting lost back there. Like you mentioned, the really used appliances. And, you know, for the regular use appliances, I usually try to, if the client has unfinished basement space, sometimes we can put together, you know, the wire shelving, like the metro shelves together, and we call it a satellite pantry. So we'll create a home for all those appliances. So if it, you do get up and you have a beautiful Sunday where everybody slept late and you want to make um, waffles, you know, that's where you know where the waffle irons live and you can go find them very easily, but they're not taking up day-to-day -day space. Does that help, Sarah? Awesome. It helps. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. I've noticed that appliances, it, we keep adding appliances to our home. You know, we have to have an air fryer now, or we have to oh, have yeah. a, you know, all of these things. And it, cabinets are not set up very easily to cabinets are not up. really set up so i mean and honestly that's what commercial kitchens do i mean all almost all their storage is on metro shelves so um having an appliance home you know if you if you're lucky enough to have a, a walk-in pantry you can kind of create that the wire shelves that can kind of hold um hold your appliances so you can have an appliance garage i was lucky enough with one client she's loved 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 to cook and they had space and we ended up actually we had room for two pantries. So like her refrigerator was in the middle and we had a pantry on one side that was just appliances and platters and big serving ware and then and cooking gadgets. And then the pantry on the other side was um, food, food storage only. So, and it worked great, but she had had the room to do it. So if you don't have the room to do it, if you have, um, you know, a closed cabinet, in the garage also makes a great space because they're not, you know, it's not like you're storing food out in the garage. You can always just wipe it down, but especially with the closed cabinet, you keep the dust and the road salt off of things. Great. Uh, anybody else uh, have any questions for Paula? All right. Well, thank you so much, Paula. This was wonderful, very informational. And uh, I don't know about anybody else, but my whole house is going to be organized by the end of this weekend because <laughs> I'm excited about it. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for the opportunity. It was, it's great to see faces and, and, and have the chance to work with you, Molly. So thank you very much and all, all right. that attended.